Hi there, so this is our second lecture in social problems class, and we're gonna go over, we're gonna review some of the foundational things from your sociology class that you need to carry with you, brush up on, so that you can fully understand and take part in the topics that we're gonna discuss in our social problems class. And so some these are uh, sociology concepts that are reviewed for you in chapter one, so these correspond with the topics that are in chapter one. You need to take notes on this lecture, my examples that I talk to you about are different than the examples that um, that your textbook author uses. Um, I don't have full definitions for these things on the board. You've got definitions from your sociology book and your notes that you undoubtedly still have. You've got definitions that are printed in the textbook um, that you can use, but I'm going to give you, I will say, speech-wise, our definitions of these things um, as we talk in this video. So, social structure is one of the major components that you need on the forefront of your mind when we're understanding social problems. Remember from the last lecture, we said that a social problem is only a problem when someone perceives it to be. That's the subjectivity, the subjective element of a social problem. So social structure exists, and so that's the objectivity. There is a social structure or a framework for society that we live in, and when people understand that certain issues in that framework or that blueprint of society are problematic, that is the subjectivity. The fact that the structure exists in the first place is the objective part. So when we think of social structure, uh, think of a blueprint for a building. If you've ever seen a blueprint or if you want to Google what blueprints look like, you will see a two-dimensional picture of all the rooms, all the schematics for the building, like the plumbing and the, uh, the internet and the wiring and the fire extinguisher, all these different kinds of things, the walls, the floors, um, the, you know, the ventilation system. You'll see all of those things that go into building a building properly, right? Your reinforcements and things like this. Um, insulation, there's all kinds of stuff that have to go into building a building so it does everything that it is supposed to do for the people who use it. So a building is something tangible, right? We can touch it and we can see it and we can feel it. Society doesn't have tangible parts to it. Society is a conceptual building. It's a conceptual structure that exists on the macro scale, but it has a blueprint also. And the blueprint that it has, we cite in sociology that the blueprint is made up of at least these three categories of things. There are social institutions. Many, many, many social institutions exist in our society and societies around the world. There are statuses and roles. In other words, there are positions that people occupy in society and duties that we have to perform that go along with those positions. And then there are social groups, the micro side of society, where you and I live out our statuses and our roles within the social groups that we belong to. We are in a class together right now. I am living out my status of teacher by teaching you these topics. You are living out your status of student by taking notes and following along with these lectures and the course schedule and all this kind of stuff. And so our social group of this class together, we are living out, so this is our micro situation, you and me in the social group, and we are living out the statuses and roles that come from the social institution called the education system. So all of these things are connected, just like the ventilation system and the electrical system and the plumbing and the walls and the floor are connected in a building, right? So. Social institutions are the big macro level patterns that we have to live by. And the social institutions establish norms for what the statuses are in a society, the roles that we're supposed to fill according to that status, and the social groups that we belong to. And so these social groups, these statuses and roles, the, the design of our social institutions, these are the things that can be analyzed to see whether they are harmful or problematic for certain sections of society. And so when we talk about a social problem, we don't just simply talk about it for the fact that, huh, isn't that too bad? There's something that harms somebody. No, we look at it at when we perceive that there is a problem and that it's something, uh, some component of social 
social structure is harmful, then the next step is to fix it. And the way that we fix it depends upon our point of view. It depends upon the theory that we use. It depends upon our outlook for how severe or how connected to other components of society um, certain problems, there's my air quotes, problems in society are. And we're going to get back to, I think I used poverty in an example in a previous lecture. So we're going to talk about poverty again in just a second. Um, uh, but before we do that, let's talk about something that is always closely intertwined with social structure. Culture overlaps social structure so intimately, the marriage is unbreakable of culture and social structure. So culture essentially is made up of patterns that people share in society, patterns about norms, which are behavioral um, standards, right? Three types of norms that you'll read about in your textbook as a refresher. Customs, rituals, habits, beliefs, trends, language, material objects, like a knife and fork compared to chopsticks. There are material objects even that are specific to a culture. But as far as culture goes, the patterns that we agree about in our society affect the shape of, here's my um, air quotes because we're talking about an abstract shape, right? We're not literally talking about a building shape that we can touch, but the shape of the social institutions is, is directly related to the beliefs of the culture. For instance, um, let's look at the education system. I've already used that a little bit with the statuses and roles and that kind of thing. So in our society in the USA, the education system is expected that all of the citizens will attend it from kindergarten through 12th grade at least. There is a push in society today. Some people perceive the 12th grade stop in education as a social problem. And so some people want to push um, the education, free education, all the way up through grade 14, which is essentially what you and I are doing right now. Our sociology class is 2333. The two on the beginning of it means it's a sophomore level in college class. And so sophomore level in college is grade 14. And so some people in society perceive that our economy that requires a college degree for so many of the degree programs, the uh, career fields, I mean, that people might want to go into, our economy requires so many um, people to have degrees in order to go into their particular career field of choice. And because education past grade 12 is not free, some people perceive that this is a significant contributor to long-term poverty for people because if you cannot pay for your education out of your pocket, you have to get a loan for it or a scholarship, and let's face it, not all of us qualify. Not all of us have a lottery scholarship opportunity. So if we are unable to pay for it, we have to take out a loan, and if we are able to achieve our degree and get a job, that our degree qualifies us for at a higher rate of pay, so much of that pay has to go back in to paying for that, um, for that uh, degree that we got, that education that we paid for, that we really don't realize that increase in standard of living that you would expect to experience based on your higher level of degree, your higher level of job opportunity, and it's supposed to come with a higher salary, but if some of your higher salary is already spent because you spent it back in your educational career, then when do you get to realize that economic uplift that education is supposed to give for everybody? It's supposed to be a great equalizer where people can achieve higher levels of income and a higher standard of living based on higher educational attainment. And so some people in our culture look at the education system design as a social problem because it puts barriers in front of people who don't come into the system with resources that equal others. If you're, so if your resources coming into the system are lower, then you're going to have a harder time finishing on time, paying for it yourself, graduating without huge debt, all of those things. Uh, some people have advantages and don't have to do all that. Others have to deal with all of that. And so 
our social institution, the education system, is designed to try to get an equalizer so that we can have an opportunity for economic uplift, and everybody is supposed to be able to, to do that, males and females alike. Now, I, another topic, aside from poverty or as, aside from educational attainment, one of the topics that we're going to cover is um, on uh, gender inequality. Uh, that's uh, later on in the, in the textbook, but we're going to look at that as a social problem. And in the United States, we expect males and females both to go from kindergarten to 12th grade. In other cultures, however, the culture, notice I said that, in other cultures, the idea, the belief about females is that their status as a female means that their role is not supposed to be getting an education and going into a profession, but their role is supposed to be a domestic function within the household. In other societies, there are not social institutions like social security that elderly people get so they can remain independent. There are not social institutions like a daycare component of the education system that is paid for for people. And so females in other cultures all over Africa, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, Southwest Asia, all over the world, there are cultures that have this really overarching idea, this belief that a female's place is in the domestic role. That's the way their culture looks at it. So many females aren't even literate in those places, and if you are literate, that's about the extent of your education, because usually you're, in, you're allowed, not encouraged, but allowed to go to school maybe until the fifth grade, sixth, seventh, eighth is usually like the cutoff where they, they the other cultures, in their belief system would accept a female to be educated up to about that point. But if your master status, which is assigned to you by the cultural pattern, if your master status says that as a female, you need to fill a domestic role, your status as a female means that you should do work in the domestic area, take care of the elderly in the family, house them, fix the meals for everybody, um, make sure that you have children and you rear them properly and all those kinds of things, then that's a, you know, four full-time jobs that I just mentioned, uh, four full-time unpaid jobs that I just mentioned. And so that's the standard in other cultures. So there might be an education system that is available to all members of the population, but, oh, I just said all members of the population all members of the population that it's supposed to, based on their culture, based on their customs, their traditions, their rituals, their beliefs, males are the ones who need an education, are supposed to get an education because they're supposed to fill a public function uh, for a family or for themselves or for society instead of, so that's their master status, their ascribed status of male ends up being their master status, which opens the door to the education system for them. I've got a flyer in my office about um, the education system in Saudi Arabia, and it's this beautiful flyer. It talks about all the advancements in technology and um, you know, not only teaching the kids about it, but having those resources in the classroom. And then you flip to the, to the back page, and it's like a short paragraph at the end. I was reading this from my American mindset. I'm reading this, and I'm thinking, oh, this sounds great. And the thought never occurred to me that females would not be participants in this system they were, they were uh, describing. But on the back, uh, the very bottom, it says something about even females are educated through the eighth grade or something. I can't remember, I'm paraphrasing. I don't have it with me, but um, I'm paraphrasing. And uh, you know, the thought, it, it kind of was a slap in the face. I was like, wait a minute, oh, um, I was assuming because my lens, my cultural lens, made me look at the education system in a biased way, biased according to the pattern that I grew up with and I learned which is males and females alike can and should go to school and get an education. Uh, even though males and females alike can and should go to school and get an education in our culture, we believe that, um, there are still folks within our culture, and, and I'm not criticizing them at all, but there are many folks in our culture 
who say there are social problems with equity in educational offerings, equity in pay for the same degree plan that males and females complete. So there are, in other words, social problems are in the eye of the beholder and the culture that you come from is a huge, huge filter that we look through when we are interpreting whether certain aspects of our culture are or are not problematic. So when you're reading chapter one, you will review what these definitions are. You will review concepts like ascribe status and achieve status that I have mentioned as, as we have covered some of this. I don't have those definitions for you on the board, but if you are vaguely remembering these things but can't quite remember the definition, you must, must, must review those for yourself. And I suggest you don't even rely on the ebook to go back and look for them, but write them down or type them out, however it is that you're taking your notes. Please, please, please take notes. Um, just like this was a face-to-face -face class, this is not just some kind of online class where you're going to have to log in, read something, and take a quiz. I make you look at me in the eyeballs over this class, so please write those definitions down so you have them handy and you can refer back to them because you have to remember these foundational concepts in order for so many of the topics that we are going to discuss. We have a broad range of topics we're going to discuss and we're going to go into them as deeply as time allows, but we don't have much time to go very, very deeply, so, um, so it's, I rely on you to do your due diligence and review these sociology topics and how important they are for social outlook and for perception, because perception is so key. The subjective elements of a social problem are so key for what we are going to look at um, in in uh, this class this semester. For instance, I have the word beliefs down here on a list of, of culture. Please don't think of the word belief as only referring to religious faith. Belief is much deeper and broader than that because, for instance, one of the social problems that people perceive at home and around the world is food insecurity. Um, people are hungry and poverty contributes to the fact that people go without food and proper nourishment. Well, in our culture, there are a lot of horses. Horses are these huge animals. They have a lot of muscles all over them. Muscles are meat. Some people in our culture believe that we shouldn't eat muscles at all. But even if you are not somebody who's vegan or vegetarian, if you are a meat eater yourself, as am I, if I suggest that you eat a horse, have your are your beliefs on hot fire right now? Whoa, she's saying we should eat a horse? Well, what I'm saying is horse has a lot of muscle, so there's a lot of meat on that thing, and that meat is perfectly digestible and nutritious for the human anatomy to, and, and physiology to process. So there is a lot of meat and opportunity for calories that hungry people could have in their lives, but our belief about not eating horses or dogs or cats or snakes or you know any of these other things, there's a ton of meat out there that in the American mindset, in our pattern for thinking, we don't include on the table, we include as wildlife or we include as pets or we include as off limits when we're talking about Sunday supper. And so in the problem of food insecurity, if that is a problem that some groups perceive as a threat or harmful to society, and it is, we have to look at suggestions that are on the table for curing that food insecurity. Another suggestion is um, crickets and grasshoppers and slugs and all kinds of stuff that are perfectly edible and nutritious for humans. But you're probably squirming in your chair right now thinking about having to eat it. It's plentiful very cheap to raise, very environmentally friendly to raise, plentiful, 
But our belief system, our customs, our rituals, our norms for thinking of creepy crawly things or hoppity things like a cricket or a grasshopper, we don't think of them as food. So we can't think of them as um, part of our food supply, or we don't think of them as part of our food supply. <coughs> Pardon me. Okay. So, so please, when you are reading over this stuff that we go over very, very quickly in chapter one, please understand the depth of importance that these things have for understanding and filtering our knowledge about what is or isn't a cultural problem, a social problem that is, and what is or isn't a fix for these perceived social problems, because sometimes the fix um, might be off limits to us simply because of the belief that a dog is our pet and our friend instead of something that we barbecue on the tailgate before the football team, before the football game. Um, you know, boom, that's, that's hard to think about, right? Um, but yeah, so belief is much more than, it, it does, certainly does include religious beliefs, but it's much more than that. It, it can cover just mundane things like food. Okay, and so um, lots of different social institutions. In the next video, I'm going to talk about family and marriage patterns really quick and how culture overlaps our ideas of family and marriage patterns. And um, so I'll see you there. Okay, bye.